Hey, hello. Yeah, uh, my name is Thorsten, and I'm a professor in uh, Germany, but also the founder of the company Zener Labs. And today I will speak about uh, the newest results we have in the company. And we're aiming at something I call new adaptive artificial intelligence. One second. So, yeah, I think. Uh, Tools have made a very important contribution to the development of mankind. But usually we use tools to um, create something, but we use tools. And um, our vision today is that we have tools that are more on our same level, that it can do something autonomously that represent the human mind. And we have made some great progresses like self-driving cars you see here, or of course ChatGPT. And that's amazing. It's awesome to see that. And that's a huge improvement uh, of how we approach the way to uh, create artificial intelligence. Nevertheless, it's still far away from a real representation of our mind in a machine. The machine might be able to work in the real world, but it's not able to understand what's going on in the way we understand what, what uh, the world means. So the question is, how can we achieve that? How can we create an artificial, artificial intelligence that is as good as our mind is? And this is what I wanted to, to, to discuss to, with you today. So we have an approach that is utilizing the human mind to train an AI. When we look at uh, the human mind evolving over time, um, Let's start at the beginning. We have a baby coming to the world and um, equipped with a great brain, a lot of sensory input, eyes, ears, other senses. And it's constantly getting a lot of data. And this data is annotated by the parents, um, providing a lot of uh, additional information to understand the world and also by the world itself. So when I see a leaf falling down as a first time in my life, I understand there's something like gravity. And I think we all agree it takes some time for the system to understand the world better. I mean, um, we constantly learn, but uh, we need at least a few decades to really be able to maneuver in the world in a meaningful way. We now look at an artificial intelligence, how we train it today. It has com computing power, and we provide it with a lot of data, but compared to the data we receive in a human, it's really not that large. And more importantly, the data is not annotated well. It's very simplified data. You know, we have binary data, whatever, but it's, it's not contextualized. This data is um, partly in itself contextualized, but not really realistically in the world. And this is why we see great success in ChatGPT or large language models, models because in the data itself, there's a coherent structure that represents the world to some degree. But more importantly, the human needs decades to arise and we expect AIs to become intelligent, to work uh, in the world in, an, in, in a meaningful way after a short term of training, a short term of training. And furthermore, we discuss the alignment problem a lot, the human compatibility of AIs because we are afraid that they might do something that are, is not good for us. But I find it really interesting to see that the alignment problem is not really well defined. We a lot of this, we use that term, but what it really actually, what we mean with it is uh, often unclear. And uh, I go with it uh, with an analogy with Stuart Russell. Maybe some of you, of, of you know that, the unaligned kitchen robot. So let's assume we on the year 2050, and we have a robot in our kitchen that is preparing food for us. It's doing it perfectly in a way that we like the food, that it's healthy for us, and that it's sustainable. And let's say we eat meat, we decide to eat meat, and on Wednesday there's meat day, and it's uh, trying to create some food, but there's no protein in the kitchen drawer. So the, the fridge is empty. And then it's an AI, so it tries to uh, find a solution. And then the dog comes around. <laughs> okay, how should the AI know that we are willing to eat a pig, but not a dog? 
I mean, how, how could it know that? Of course, we can tell that to the AI, but we want it to infer it by itself. And the problem is, if you have to tell it to the AI, to the robot in this case, we have to explain it verbally in a meaningful way. And there are so many things we would have to explain if the AI couldn't uh, infer it by itself, what is good for us, that it shares the same value system that we have. And my uh, solution for that problem is to learn from the brain. Because we have the brain as a system, when you look at this, uh, at this in a systematic way, that evolved in the world, that can understand the world, and that is um, generating information about how we process the world. And when we can capture that information and translate it into the machine and embed it into a machine, the machine might become something like what I call a digi digital, cop digital copy of ourselves. So it is copying our conscious interpretation of the world. And that is what I think how we should use our technology to create artificial intelligence. So of course we need still uh, transformers and whatever, but we should annotate the data we have in the real world with our brain responses. And of course for that you need an interface. And luckily we are working for almost five decades on the development of um, brain computer interfaces. You're aware of what that is, and you see the closed loop cycle of an uh, BCI. And classically, it's used for direct control, so like replacing a, a button press on a computer. Um, and with that, restrictions is mainly used for people with disabilities. But I propose to use it as a passive brain computer interface because the brain is exhibiting information about different mental processes like mental workload, emotions interpretations like, this is wrong, I don't like what I see here, or context-related responses like, I'm surprised to see that, intentions, what we, what we want to do. And when we use that, um, we can enable a machine to adapt to the operator implicitly. So it does it without me needing to tell the machine what to do. It understands because it's observing me. So it might be even without my awareness that it adapts to myself. And with that, we can the machi machine is able to derive uh, our ideas, concepts, and intentions from our actions uh, itself. And we have shown uh, different examples in the last two decades how new adaptive HCR, human computer interaction, could work. But what's next? And I would like to talk about what's next now. So, my aim is creating new adaptive AIs. And I do that with, in my company where we received a funding for a project, which is called Project NAFAS, new, Adapt new, Adapt new Adaptivity for Autonomous Systems. It's funded by the German government with 30 million euros, and we're trying to overcome the obstacles which are currently there to bring BCIs to the real world, but also create first examples of new adaptive AI, and I would like to show you how we would do that. So, the first thing is mobile and secure EG. When you look at EG caps right now, you see big caps, lots of work to uh, apply them that look awfully. And what we want to do is we want to go with unobtrusive, modular, self-applicable uh, EG by placing them behind the ears, for example. So here you see the first uh, prototypes, a secret, developed by a colleague of mine, and we have access to that, and we will further develop that. So you put that behind your ear, and you get some data uh, emitted by the brain. But we want to extend that by putting other electrodes on the front, front, front head where no hair is growing. So uh, it's easy to apply as well, and it might not even look nice. But I think it's not enough. I think we get a lot of, uh, good, good lot of data there, but we need some data from the center of the head. So we are looking now uh, to find a way to place two or three electrodes on the top of your head, and then you can do it yourself. But that's not it. Of course, we need a small amplifier. You see a prototype of that. So that's the same thing as you can buy now as an EG amplifier, which is at least this size, or maybe half of the size. And here you see an example of how well the system works with the secret on both sides for workload uh, detection. So the gray bars are the standard 64 channel cap when you use a state-of-the-art EG system. And the red bars are showing what we uh, get when we use uh, uh, both sides of the year's uh, secrets. So there's a loss of 2.5 si percentage points. 
And the next step is that we do all the processing of the BCI on a trip. We don't, do not upload it to the cloud. Um, you're fully aware of what you're doing there. You can select what kind of information you send out. Because I think if, if people want to use a BCI, they need to trust it. And um, I do not know, I, mean, I, I do, but many people do not know what can be inferred from the EG signal you send out. But if you have a button, happiness, surprise, error, you know what kind of information you send out. You can uh, select to send it out or not. The second problem we have um, to overcome is the calibration of the BCI. This usually takes up to an hour to calibrate one single BCI. And um, so we take data, usually data from a single person. And what we are going to do, going to do in the project now is we, we collect data from 4,000 people and calibrate a BCI on that. And that BCI is not individualized, so it doesn't work only on your head. It will, uh, it's transferable to any other person. So right now I have a, a BCI for error detection on my USB stick that would work on your head as good as any individually trained BCI that we would train right now. And then we want to uh, have it applicable in different applications. So that it's not only search for a certain application, but that you can use, generalize it over applications as well. And for that, we have already examples of um, workload or error potential uh, classifiers that work like that. And we are going to do, develop here up to 15 BCIs, uh, reflecting 15 diff different states. And the big important step here is you can run them simultaneously. So right now, you can do one or two BCIs because it takes up to an hour to calibrate them. But there, that's a plug and play system. You can uh, get 15 different mental states at the same time without any effort. And that reflects your full mental state, not only a part of it. Okay, what are, what are we going to do with that? Something I call new adaptive reinforcement learning. So assume you have an AI. I chose ChatGPT's logo, or OpenAI's logo, but let's assume you have an AI. And that has a model about the world. The gray bars are the model of the world. And then we have a human in the same context. This, this human is perceiving the same thing as the AI. And it sees the action of the AI. Then it can, of course, it will, the per person will interpret the actions of the AI. And it will tell whether they like it, whether they think it's good, whether they're happy about it. So you get a multi-dimensional uh, uh, mental response from that reflected by this vector, which is fed back to the AI that it can adapt its model. It's like a multimodal uh, reward function. And furthermore, you can explain the meaning of these dimensions to the AI. You could say x1 is the level of surprise, x2 is the degree of error, x3 is the current workload. And when you take all that information into account, the AI can understand in a better way what it's doing because you give meaning to the values you have there. Okay, but that's theoretically, theoretically, but I have a proof of concept for that. It's just one dimensional in this case. So we invited people to our labs, equipped them with the 64 channel EG, so that uh, was in 2016, and we let them observe this scenario here. We told them there's a cursor, the red circle with a white dot inside, and that is going to jump to adjacent nodes. But the target is, it should re uh, reach the target in the right uh, bottom corner. And the first run was just, the cursor was running, uh, uh, jumping randomly, and they just observed it. So that, they would probably inter internally say that was a bad move, that's a good move, another good move, but it's totally randomly, it will not jump to the target here, very unlikely, bad move. And they were just sitting there observing that target. They didn't have a, a specific task, just observe that, and internally judge what you see there. Of course, after a while, after eight minutes or something, it would reach the target uh, accidentally, but we learned something from that. We didn't tell that to the people, but we learned from their brain signals. We understood how the brain signal looks like when you're happy with it and when you're unhappy with it. And we used that for reinforcement learning. So we used that, the, the brain signal, as a reward function for um, reinforcement learning. So the length of the arrows indicates the likelihood that it goes, uh, uh, where the cursor would go. And let's assume it goes in the first step to the right-hand side, one step. Then we could ask a brain, and it would provide this signal, for example. And we already learned that is a good signal. 
So we would increase the likelihood into that direction and for the next jump. And then the next jump happens, and for, let's say it goes to the upper left corner, which is probably a bad move, and we get a different response in the brain, and we know already that's a bad move. So we reduce the probabilities into that direction for the next jump. Already after three jumps, the cursor knows, oh, I should go to the right or maybe the upper right. And a different perspective on the same thing is that the cursor is building up a model of your directional preferences. It's building up a model of a part of your cognition. So that's not a full cognitive copy, but it understands what you like and what, you, what your values are in this system. So the cursor would jump somewhere, you get a brain response, and it would adapt its model it has had before, and would continuously do, continue, continue do that until it understands what you want to do. So, the next video will show you how that looked like. On the left-hand side, you will see the cursor moving around. On the right-hand side, you will see the model. The people, this is real data, but the, subject, uh, the participant only saw the left-hand side, only the, they didn't saw the model. Didn't see the model. So, first uh, jump was bad, we reduced the probabilities. The model is adapting step by step. And you see there's a coherent idea this direction is the best direction, and the cursor is reaching the target very much faster. We also applied that to a new set of uh, grid, which is larger, and also here, the model takes a little bit longer to, uh, to, to take form, but step by step, the cursor learns what is a good way to go for. And we asked people, do you see a difference here to the first one? And they said, yes, it's going much faster. We asked them, do you know why? And they had ideas like the target is more often in the upper right corner or something like that. But nobody of the 24 people had the idea that they were influencing the target or the cursor. So also here on the 6x6 six six grid, it does some, some mistakes, but it reaches the target very quickly. And without the awareness of the person. And when we look at the statistics, you see that on the 4x4 four four grid, it takes roughly, um, on median, 27 drums, 27 drums to reach the target uh, accidentally, and 90 drums on the 6x6 six six grid. With our reinforcement, it only takes 13 steps on the 4x4 four four grid and 23 steps on the 6x6 six six grid. That's uh, a huge improvement, of course, but how good is it? So we used uh, perfect reinforcement. So we told the cursor, basically, where the target is, and reinforce its actions, and you see that it would need 10 drums with a perfect reinforcement and 14 drums here, so we're really close to that. With that simple form of reinforcement learning, with the one-dimensional BCR output, we could make the cursor reach the target. And here you see a trajectory, how the cursor moved. It started here, moved there, and here you see the model, how it uh, evolved over time, and you see this is the result of that. Not everything looked as nice, so there were also some misalignment, but in the end, it uh, got the right um, so, uh, model. And when you look at the signal itself, we of course know there's a good response and a negative response. But in this uh, paradigm, we can operationalize or interpret uh, the, each move differently. We could say we could color code the degree of deviation from the target. So black would mean it goes directly to the target, red would mean it was goes to the opposite, and in between, we have color coding in different angles. And when you look at the ERP, so here's the jump, um, here's the uh, amplitude of the EG signal, um, and here's the response. You see there's a linear uh, dependency of the de uh, degree of error with the, uh, with the brain response. So you're not can, you can not only see good and bad, but also any shade in between. And we localized that with a quite complex method in the prefrontal cortex. And we could relate it to predictive coding. So we are tapping into the predictive coding of the human mind, which is basically the, re the reward function of the human mind. This is how, our, there's a theory out there which tells us this is how we learn ourselves. So we can uh, tap into higher order of cognition and we are assessing the reward function of the brain. So that is proof that this reinforcement learning works. The last example is a little bit more complex. <clears throat> When we think about how is our, our intelligence that rises in ourselves, we know that biological learning is categorical. What does it mean? So one way to uh, train a biological system is clicker training. You know, you might 
uh, have heard about that, that you can click on your, uh, reward your dog when you click on good occasions. And that is not the optimal learning. A way better one is that you have categories. So I have an idea what a um, cup is, and I could pour water in it, and I've learned that in my life, and for the first time I see a mug. And I see the mug is similar to the cup, but it's not the same thing. So I transfer the knowledge I have from the cup to the mug, but have a new entity and adapt that independently of the other one. And then I have subcategories and whatever and whatever. And that is a way better theory to describe human learning than clicker training. Funnily, there was a TV show in Germany recently, Clicker Train Your Baby, where they proposed that you don't have to teach anything to your baby, you can just clicker train it, it's, it's really good. It came from the UK, so that was <laughs> a nice TV show. Okay, but how, when we look at um, how do machines learn currently, so how do we do machine learning? We all speak about machine learning, how we do that. We have um, supervised learning, two classes, good and bad, or we have reinforcement learning, but that's nothing else but clicker training. It's the same thing, so why, if we no, clicker training is not the best way to do it. Why do we do it all the time? Why don't we use uh, categorical learning on the, on the machine? The problem is we can't do it. There's no way to implement the categories. So my mind has probably millions of categories in itself. So if I would be able to access that, I would need a long time to transfer that into a machine. If I would have a machine that could explain what my categories are, it would already be intelligent. So that's a real problem. There's no way at the moment to implement categories in an, AI, in an AI. There is theory about that, what would happen if we had that, and it's showing tremendous increase in reliability, but we don't know how to do that yet. But I will show you that we can do that with the passive PCI as well. So here we have a task. It's just a proof of concept again. You see letters Q, D, B, and P, which are the same letters. You can rotate or flip, but it's the same symbol, and then you have a square or a circle around it. And we invited people to interpret this um, selection of symbols. And we gave them a random uh, rule that say, the question was, are there more circles in a B than Qs in a square? And then they have to judge, yeah, it's true or it's not true. That's one example. But you can exchange these rules by any other rule. It's just a random rule. And our theory was that they would identify firstly the Bs in a, a square, uh, Qs in a square and the Bs in a circle as relevant. And they would also differentiate the Bs in a circle with a different brain response compared to the Qs in a square. So the brain would emit a different response, and we could collect that with the EG. And the response to all the other symbols are, is a different one. So we have three, different, three categories of brain responses, the red circle, the green circle, and the yellow circle, circle and they re represent the different types of stimuli we see there. Okay, but of course, this is not a, it's a solvable problem. So you can use standard machine learning to solve this problem, right? And when you do that, we have this approach here. It's a state-of-the-art way to uh, solve this problem. And we get this result. You know, after 1,500 trials, we have 82% of accuracy if we do supervised learning. And here you see it's the trajectory. It starts at 50%, goes a little bit down, and then up, and it's linear learning. This is what we expect from, from state-of-the-art machine learning. And now we took the same model, but inserted the brain response. So we gave an additional sensor, additional information. And here you see how well that worked. The blue curve is showing the result on the same training, but with brain signals. So you see at the end, after 1,300 trials, it's already with 100% accurate. It doesn't do any error after that anymore. And in the beginning, after 150 trials, you're already at 68%. It learns very quickly and continuously with 20% of improvement. And that's huge. Usually when you have an improvement in accuracies of AIs, you might have one or two percent points and you're happy, and we have here 20%. And that shows that passive PCIs can also improve the learning of an AI in a categorical way. And I think if you do it more extensively, which we will do in the project, we can create a lot of categories in an AI and we'll understand the world better as we do. So here again, uh, here you see the things we do in NAFAS, the project. We will first develop tools like the EG headset, um, the classifiers, databases. So we will collect 4,000 data sets, which we will make available to the public. So you can use them, these 4,000 data sets, in probably three years. And then we will have 
uh, an implementation of the new adaptive HCI, new adaptive AI part, and have several demonstrators in there. Okay, concluding in the last two minutes. What I think what you should have is a convergence of the human mind with artificial intelligence. So when, when, when we want to make this robot more capable, we need to integrate its own processing with information about the human mind. The human mind can annotate the world and make it accessible to the robot and give meaning to what it sees there. Currently, the robot might, an AI can describe what it sees here. There's a cup, there's people sitting there, and a camera and whatever, but it doesn't have an idea what it means. And when we annotate it with the brain responses, categorical learning, reinforcement learning, I am sure the machine can get better, and it might become an equal partner to us, which is totally aligned with us. What do I mean with alignment with each person? So I don't think that we have alignment in a group, but we might have an AI, your personal assistant, that is totally aligned to yourself in that way. That's it. And we're hiring.